first-person shooters to Russian supermodel simulators, and a Lord of the Rings parody game are just a few of the 16 games Gaijin made before they hit it big with War Thunder. Today, we're diving into the history of these games, and for a company that's known for flight simulators, you are not going to believe the journey I'm about to take you on, or the fact that every single one of these games runs on a version of the Daegor engine that War Thunder still uses to this day. It all starts in 2003 with the release of Boomer, Sorvania Bashni. The story of the game is based on the film of the same name, all about this BMW, and most of the game is you basically standing on the roof and shooting at cars chasing you, and you even have some control over the car as you can shout orders to the driver. The game doesn't really spawn enough enemies, so it gets a little bit boring, but the more interesting part of the game is the first person shooter sections. Each level has no checkpoints, so you need to be really careful dying, but that is made a lot easier by the amount of power-ups enemies drop. It's kind of hard for me to tell what each power-up does since the game is only available in Russian and I already had a hell of a time getting through the menus but most of the time you seem to get healed although there's occasionally temporary boosts like super speed or invisibility. I'm not sure if Gaijin is still looking for bug reports on this game but the physics are a little bit wonky and if you strafe into a wall you end up climbing it. The most whack part of the game though is the racing section. The car controls are understandably janky for a game this old, but for some reason there's a roll button and a jump button. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Get to the finish line before the timer runs out. On some levels, you're racing an AI opponent, and on others, you're just being attacked and your friends will defend the car. It's kind of wholesome to see when the credits roll that the Udenseth brothers have been in this business together since the beginning. Completing the final level also unlocks a bonus survival stage that never ends, even after waves and waves of enemies. In 2004, Gaijin attended the Moscow Conference of Computer Game Developers to show off their playable demo of their newest project. I don't think anyone was expecting their next game to be a motion-controlled webcam-based dragon simulator. At the time of the conference, Flight of Fancy had been in development for several months, and the biggest problem Gaijin were facing was finding a publisher, which I can only assume didn't happen as the game was ultimately cancelled before release. At the time the game was cancelled, all the characters and story had been completely finished, and the game was going to have you play as a dragon and able to cast many spells in a medieval mythical setting. Fighting off other dragons and medieval siege equipment, it's interesting to think what could have been. Despite the failure of this game, Gaijid would not give up on the idea of motion controls with a webcam and will return to the concept years later. With all the weird games in this video, it's weird that none of them are a dedicated naval game. With the sponsor of this video, you can get stuck into some exciting naval battles. World of Warships has so many different ships and nations to play on all sorts of different maps and they're always adding more content. What I really find fun in the game is playing the Japanese destroyers. You sneak around the map and because your torpedoes are really good but your ship's made of essentially paper mache, it means you have to be really sneaky but then when you actually get your torpedoes to hit, it's amazing. And then they've got HMS Belfast in the game, which is actually also a museum ship. When I was a lot younger, I went to see it and it was a really nice day out with my family and I really treasure that memory. There's so much history to it so it's really awesome seeing how accurately they modelled it in the game. Which is really cool because they told me that it takes around six months to make one ship. If I had six months to make a ship, I'd probably leave it to the last minute and end up with something looking a bit like this. If you haven't played the game before, now's the time to get stuck in. Click my link in the description and use code BRAVO and you'll get a really nice starter pack that will give you a massive head start. Playing as a Russian supermodel slash race car driver, the premise of Adrenaline is to become the most influential of all the drivers. The game has a mechanic system where you have to promote yourself in the media alongside racing and the idea is you have to balance both parts of the game to succeed. Although I found if you win enough races it doesn't really matter. I actually quite enjoyed playing this game for the amount of unique game modes. In addition to the standard race format there's a mode where you blow up the most amount of cars before the timer runs out or do tricks to get the most style points. There's even special maps designed for these game modes that take place in the weirdest locations like on an aircraft carrier or at the Louvre. There's a bunch of different abilities you can use during a race to make things more interesting but I found that using the nitro boost was just the most overpowered way of winning. There's a sequel to the game released in 2009 called Streets of Moscow that is much more of an open world game but I couldn't play the game too much because anytime you move the camera even a tiny bit the entire game would freeze. Oh, I can't see where I'm going. 
Interestingly, we can already start to see the ties to War Thunder and modern Daegor games as the graphics menu in the launcher is laid out in a very similar way. And I was really surprised to find that as early as 2005, Gaijin were building a replay system into their games and you can see how the camera angles here have a certain familiarity to the automatic camera angles you can find in War Thunder. Blind Man's Bluff is a 2005 isometric shooter and it almost destroyed my friend's computer. Just like the first game we talked about, this game is also based on a movie and instead of cutscenes, it just uses clips directly taken from the film. My good friend Swartz helped out massively with this video and when he installed this game on his computer, a 20 year old defunct DRM piracy protection system stopped his computer from booting to Windows. Luckily, he had a restore point to return to and everything was okay, but go check him out in the link in the description if you don't know him already. Looking at some YouTube gameplay, there's not much to say. There's a few different weapons you can pick between, dual wielded guns, machine gun and even a flamethrower, but the game is just repeatedly killing wave upon wave of enemy. And even at the end of the game, there's not particularly a final boss. The game sort of just ends. Game reviewers at the time called it dull and unsatisfactory, overall getting quite a negative reception. And since then, Gaijin never returned to the isometric shooter genre. When I started down this rabbit hole of research for this video, I didn't know what I was expecting. And it definitely wasn't this. Fellas Under the Ring is a parody of Lord of the Rings with some very familiar playable characters. The game starts with a Star Wars text crawl to explain the premise of where it all began and then never references Star Wars again. As you fight your way through various levels, you mostly fight ethereal beings and zombies, but occasionally the game throws a couple of enemies straight out of Wolfenstein at you. Between levels, Dmitry Pukov, one of the developers, delivers a monologue about what is coming up in the next level. And interestingly, Dmitry founded the studio that worked with Gaijin on this game to make fun of four translations that were changing the meaning of films. The actual gameplay is a hack and slash style game where you can do combos to deal additional damage damage and when the level ends you get to purchase upgrades and powers with the points you scored in the level. After playing the game for a bit I thought I kind of knew what to expect but then I went around a corner and found what I believe to be the first appearance of a tiger tank in a Gaijin made game. There's no explanation, it's just chilling in this magical swamp. Gaijin went on to release two more games in the same style. Uniquely in one of these sequels, the Gaijin pre-game logo has red eyes and I haven't seen that appear anywhere else. I'll only mention these games briefly as they end up being quite derivative and there's not much that sets them apart from the other games Gaijin have made. So far we've had a big variety of games all running on the variation of the Daegor engine, but this is the first dedicated first person shooter. Paragraph 78 has a really good selection of different weapons in the game and I actually quite enjoyed the janky gunplay. I'm not sure if the translation of the title is Paragraph 78 or Section 78. Section 78 sounds a bit more like a video game title, but all the information I found online points to the slightly weird title of Paragraph 78. Assault rifles are horribly inaccurate, so it gives you a reason to use the different weapons and towards the end of major sections of the game you get the use of a minigun which is always a fun time. From a modern point of view the game is mechanically not that unique but it does have leaning mechanics. Also for some reason the enemies have the ability to backflip. I'm not really sure what's going on in the story as the English translation pack I found was made by someone who isn't a native speaker. It seems we fight our way to gain access to a military base by nefarious means, only to discover that it's been overtaken by a plague that turns people into a zombie-like crawling enemy. A full playthrough of the game is pretty short and there's even a speedrun that clocks in at around 20 minutes, but even still, overall I think I've enjoyed this one. Gaijin CEO Anton Yudinsev has said in interviews that he dreamed of breaking into the Japanese market and it seems it's obvious that this Lara Croft magic based tomb adventuring game released in 2007 was just that. The main character touches some orb thing, gains magical powers, meets Fortnite Ninja and then after hack and slashing your way through a bunch of levels, Fortnite Ninja becomes possessed and becomes the final boss. To learn more abilities you need to kill the different enemies and consume their souls and then spend those points on whatever you want. Honestly, I couldn't really bring myself to play this one particularly long because it's just very repetitive. Big enemies and bosses require you using spells to damage them, 
and regenerating mana is just annoying as you have to either go into your inventory and drink a potion or kill enemies which sometimes you can't do because you don't have any mana. Later on a sequel was released called Blades of Time and overall it seemed to get a lot better reviews. There was a unique mechanic where you can go back in time and then summon doppelgangers of yourself to help fight the enemies. Think of it kind of like Handsome Jack's special ability in Borderlands pre-sequel. If you want to play this one, this was the first game in this video that wasn't a nightmare to track down and is actually on the Steam store right alongside the latest War Thunder premiums. So I wasn't planning to talk about Daegore games not directly developed by Gaijin, but I thought I should mention before making crossouts, in 2012 Targon Games used the Daegore engine to literally just make chess. They tried to make it more interesting with these unique 3D models for the pieces and some special game modes where you enter a mini battle arena when a piece is taken. They've got chess puzzles as well and multiplayer so it might be interesting to someone who wants to practice their chess but as much as the graphics and animations are nice I don't see anyone particularly paying $20 for what you can do on chess.com for free. Apache Air Assault is Gaijin's first attempt at a helicopter flight sim and honestly it holds up pretty well. Enemy forces have locked acquisition radar on us. It's very arcadey but as long as you're using a gamepad the controls are pretty fun. The voice acting here is probably the best part of the game and the comms chitter chatter really makes it feel like you're a part of an important mission. I think modern War Thunder helicopter enduring confrontation PvE should be taking notes. One thing that's quite fun is you've got a button that you can press to switch to the view from just an orbital satellite. Unfortunately there is quite a limited number of helicopters and you can only pick between a couple variants of an Apache, a Hind and an MQ-8B, whatever that is. You get air to air missiles, dumbfire rockets and hellfire rockets but with how long it takes the hellfires to reload and how quite short each mission is you end up just mostly using dumbfire rockets. You can play the game in co-op and the other player controls the weapons but in single player you get an AI that controls the minigun. I noticed the sound explosion is identical to War Thunder and a fun detail at the end of each mission is you're shown how much you cost the US taxpayer. The damage models are decently detailed and it was fun being able to customise my helis with decals although the hangar was a little weird. I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that Gaijin had actually made a helicopter game way before helicopters were introduced into War Thunder. It wouldn't be until 2018 that helicopters made their way to War Thunder with update 1.81 Valkyries. When I said Gaijin would return to webcam controlled games, this was it. Although called Skydive Proximity Flight, the game is less about skydiving and more about wingsuiting. I wasn't able to get a connect to play the game as it was intended, but I think user controller made the game easier anyway. Doing tricks builds up an adrenaline bar and expending this bar either allows you to go super fast or you can use it to go back in time to avoid an impromptu landing into the wall. And interestingly the game's promotional website is still online and you can find the original trailer unlisted on the official War Thunder YouTube channel. I was the first person to comment in like 7 years. There's a couple different types of mission, you can do a race or there's special modes where it's all about just completing a special objective like doing a certain amount of tricks or flying close to the mountain for a certain amount of time. The gameplay I would describe is functional and fun for a bit but there's not much depth to it as after you do a couple of wingsuit missions you've honestly done them all. If you played Ubisoft Steep that's like a more modern version of this game. Replayability also isn't helped by the lack of unique maps, there's just really not many to play. I'm not sure if I accidentally installed a 100% save file for the game but every optional character was already available to me to play which also didn't help the replayability. Overall the game is good but there's just not much to it. Birds of Steel is a time capsule for what War Thunder looked like a decade ago. But what is easily forgotten is the even more obscure Gaijin Entertainment Flight Simulator that released three years prior to Birds of Steel. Confusingly the game has two names, on PC it's called Wings of Prey, on console it's IL-2 Sturmovic Birds of Prey. Unfortunately the PC Wings of Prey version is completely unplayable. I purchased it on Steam and good old games but both versions fail to open. It requires logging into a defunct online service called Uplay, not the Ubisoft one, to verify your purchase and because it doesn't exist, the game does not boot. I've been gaijined out of $20. 
The local second-hand shop just randomly had a copy of the game, and even still, with a physical copy, I still ran into a bunch of problems. Although I wasn't able to get the game itself running, I was able to notice something interesting. If you've ever looked at the War Thunder game files, you'll notice that the executable file is called aces.exe, which is a little bit of a weird name, but it seems that this name dates all the way back to Wings of Prey. Fortunately, I was able to get the console version running, and the first thing I noticed that was unique to this game is the fact that the game uniquely has a little video damage model showing you the damage you inflicted onto an enemy plane, kind of like we have in modern ground forces for War Thunder. In the game, you actually play as someone with a name, and then it makes you feel a little bit more connected to the pilot. Corporal Clark, you've proven yourself in basic flight training. Let's go over some of the finer moments of aerial combat. For the flight models, every sort of plane in this game kind of felt very savey. And for some reason, WEP is extremely overpowered, allowing you to fly around at 900 km an hour while you shoot down poor defenseless Heinkel 111s. The game is mostly focused around these single player missions, and there was a DLC that lets you do some more of the German stuff. Using the D-pad, you're also able to give your AI squad mates commands on how to fly. While I'm playing on the Xbox 360 version of the game, it was also released on Nintendo DS. And I believe that this is the only Daegor Gaijin flight simulator that has ever released on the Nintendo family of systems. Three years later, the precursor to War Thunder released. The game has some cursed golden lions, and for some reason Germany is the only nation to have jets. And the jet exhausts are blue? The loading screens are basically the same as today's War Thunder, and you can see how identical the test flight map is, which means this virtual airfield has been in continuous operation longer than the Second World War lasted. You can customise your profile more than you can in War Thunder, and even select a specific nation to represent yourself. You can also pick a profile icon, but realistically, there's only one worth picking. This time around, the game didn't release on PC at all and was only available on console. I was playing on an emulator so the graphics were a little bit janky but it was fine for the most part. Apart from the British test flight for some reason, that was a disaster. Oh, and the tracers were cheese slices for some reason. If you're a War Thunder player who missed out on the PO2 event, this game is a way you can get your hands on a Daegor engine PO2. And I have to say, after playing through these two games a little bit, I found a new appreciation for console War Thunder players. The game also has a prestige system to reset your progress, and it gives you a little bit more longevity and replay value. If you didn't know, War Thunder has single player campaigns, and it seems that they are directly ripped from this game. The contrast between the two missions being identical yet so different is quite something. And it shows how far Gaijin and the Daegor engine have come. Most people will probably never play these old Daegor games. So if there's only one thing you're going to take away from this video, the lesson to be learned here is within all of us is the opportunity for slow, iterative improvement. To overcome these challenges and achieve something beautiful that one day we'll look back at where we started and be amazed by how far we've come.